Good morning again. Welcome back. We are ready to get into our divine service very soon and shortly. But we are still early, so we're just waiting for people to come on. And uh, welcome, welcome to all of you. We've just had a short break from Sabbath school, but we will begin at 11.30. So for those that are in already, please think of a praise. I have my praise ready. I've typed it out. I make sure that I have something to share every week. And, uh, you know, I've been praying for an answered prayer request every day. I haven't got there yet, but we can find a praise every day for sure. You know, so welcome to all of those that are back already. But we'll be starting shortly at 11.30, okay? 11.30. So um, do think of a praise. And if you're ready, just type your praise out. Just type your praise out. Make sure you are ready to encourage. Make sure you're ready to share. Uh, it's tough. It's tough uh, being on camera in only one way. But um, the way that we can encourage each other still is to share. And it um, doesn't matter where you're coming from, where you're watching from, please share at least one praise. Okay? I'll keep the comments on for now. Until we start at 11.30, then I'll need a focus and I'll push. I figured out how to push the comments to the side. But I've been seeing what you guys have all been typing. And, uh, you know, I appreciate all that sharing and uh, honest sharing. Let's be careful what we share, though. Um, let's not heat up into a debate or anything. Um, obviously, you're, you're watching from my my page there so I, I i don't i don't want any debates to to fire up look um just make sure you go back and study out first yeah before you make any uh, hard conclusions but happy sabbath everybody thanks for coming back in we had a short break i hope you had some time to refresh yourself to make sure that you can focus for the message for this divine service time and uh, we'll be looking at a very important topic a very important topic, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about it just before we get into it, but I'll begin there at 11.30. So for all those that are joining, please, 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 share a praise. Josh and Annie, good to see you come in. Uh, I miss you guys over there in Taiwan. I see some uh, names coming through, Singru, Eliza. Um, happy Sabbath to all of you. Good morning, good morning. Peter, good morning. God bless you guys there. And uh, miss everybody, miss everybody. So uh, just praise the Lord. Yes, just definitely praise the Lord that we can study together. And so we're just waiting a few minutes for those that are in already. Blessed Sabbath to you, Adam. Happy Sabbath, Amanda. Good to see all of you. I missed someone, one name that went, kind of went through real quick. Brian, Noel. Happy Sabbath. And uh, as we're getting ready, please share a praise. Share a praise, okay? Make sure that you share a praise. Let's encourage each other. Kimberly, happy Sabbath and happy birthday. Isaac, Delina, Jana. I'm sorry, I don't recognize all the names. Happy Sabbath. Nicole, good to see you in. God bless all of you. God bless all of you. And uh, Wei Fun, happy Sabbath to you as well. And uh, good to see everyone coming in so early. And uh, we just got another couple of minutes. I want to make sure that when I say I start at 11.30, I start at 11.30, okay? So uh, we will begin in a few minutes. But it'll give you time. Jamie, good to see you come in as well. Alex, Fadi, happy Sabbath from Indonesia. Happy Sabbath to you, sister. Wing Sheng, haven't seen you for a while, brother. Happy Sabbath to you, brother. Auntie Jenny, good to see you come in. Good to see you come in. And uh, Natasha, good to see you there as well. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Just a couple of minutes, but friends, please, please, I'm begging you, share a praise. Let there be a fresh praise, okay? And uh, please, do share with us, encourage each other, and... Uh, Let's look always for the silver lining. 
Um, amen, amen. For the answered prayer request, let's look for, look for the silver lining during this time. Gabriel Junil, good to see you, brother. Good to see you, my friend. Frankie, good to see you come in. I'm sorry, there's a name there I don't know how to pronounce. Good to see all of you. Amen, amen, Bobby. Lona, we miss you. Come back quickly. All of you guys running off to Saba, please come back. Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. It is a wonderful Sabbath. And I just praise the Lord for, for being able to connect. And happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Okay, we'll be starting soon, but please share a praise. And if you're not able to, then share this message. Okay, share something. But I prefer you share a praise, encourage and ex exhort all of us here to encourage us on our Christian journey. And maybe many of us, we have missed the silver lining this past week or we don't realize that these things that sometimes we experience, though they be so small, it might be very big to other people. So please do share a praise. Happy Sabbath to all of you. My mother is online there in Australia. Had to give a shout out to my mother, right? Um, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Please share a praise. Share a praise. I'd love to hear from you all. We are starting soon. It is now 1130 and so uh, let, let's begin, shall we? Let's begin. My praise that I have for this past week is for the SALT students. Um, you know, we are having, we're in the midst of SALT. We, we're actually almost finished. We got another three weeks and then we'll be done with SALT. But I, I praise the Lord for the SALT students. Why? They're all locked down in the mission there, the guys and the ladies at where the church school is. But I just praise the Lord that I haven't heard one word of complaint you know, I praise the Lord for a wonderful group of students, and I praise the Lord that um, God has been good to them and to us. Usually when there are so many people staying together in one place, you know, there will be fires that will arise. You know, I, I travel with a small choir for a month and a half, and by the end of it, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to, to leave. But um, I just praise the Lord that though they've been holed up in a, a little area there, that we have mature students and those that are of more mature, able to help others. So... I just praise the Lord for a wonderful student group during our SALT time. And we've been having a wonderful study online. I know that sometimes I go too fast, but um, I, I am praying that through this Revelation time that every student that attends the Revelation class would experience true revival and will go forth with greater power to preach the gospel. So God has been good. He's been really good. And I just praise the Lord for the interaction we've had with the students and for that little bit of interaction we've had that God has been touching the hearts of, of all the people. So I'm just going to push the comments over so that I don't get distracted reading all that you're saying there. And so we are going to focus in on our divine service time. Now, before we get into the message, as usual, um, I just want to ask for our church to continue to remain faithful in giving. For those that are able to, um, in your tithe and offering, I want to thank the Lord that God has blessed our churches and that many are still faithful in giving and able to give to the church. Um, you can do it at the cash deposit machine or you can just do online transfer, which is always usually the best. But thank you for still supporting the work of the church. And thank you that, um, you know, you've been able to still be supported as well in some way. But let's continue to be faithful as this is the last Sabbath of April. And then next week, we will be into a new month. And so let's continue to give. And uh, if you've been blessed, let us be a blessing as well. And so I've already shared my praise for this morning. If you do have prayer requests, please type them out. And if you don't want to share it um, publicly, you can message me privately on the Facebook page there. Just send me a message. I will promise that I will pray for that prayer request that you send through. You know, so it's hard being separated and not being able to worship in person. But if you do have prayer requests, feel free to message me privately on the Facebook page there. I will be going through all the comments. Um, sometimes the comments don't seem to work. I don't seem to catch everything. So if it is important, just message me. Just message me. Um, just on the Facebook page there. Nowhere else because uh, there are too many media channels now and I don't, I don't have no notifications on any of them. So sometimes I don't check them for a day or two or a week. Um, so just message me privately before I go off to eat lunch. 
I will make sure that I cover every one of those prayer requests that you are asking for, okay? So please do share. And um, it's a time to support each other as well. So if you are posting publicly a prayer request for those that see, please just offer a prayer up for our brothers and sisters, and especially for all those that are in need at this time as well. And so if you do need help from DAC and SAC, for those that are attending our church, you do let us know. We will do our very best to help you. You know that. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and I know that God can support each and every one of us, and our churches will do the very best to be there for each other as well. Okay, so for those that are coming in, please, if you have not yet, please share a praise. I'm begging you, and please, um, I'm just asking that you would share personally how God has been good to you in this past week to exhort us and to warm us on this Christian journey during this lockdown as well that we might go forward in this week and say, you know what, that praise that that person has, God, I want to experience that as well. And that is how we can encourage each, each and every one of us as we share. So please don't be shy. Please just type out something that you are thankful for that God has blessed you with in this past week. And then I will probably try to make it one of my praises in this next week if it's something that speaks to my heart as well. Okay, so that's how we can still help each other to grow during this time of the MCO. Okay, so with that all said, let's get into our message for the hour, shall we? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we have. Thank you for bringing us back together again. As we're about to open your word, Lord, lead us, please, with your Holy Spirit. We need to understand this truth. We need to understand this because it's really important to our time. May your Holy Spirit inspire the words that we're about to listen to. Lord, be with me. Help me to articulate the words correctly that it might give honor and glory and praise back to your name, that I won't be uplifted, but that you would, O Lord, that the message that we're about to listen to would draw us closer to thy throne of grace and mercy at this time and that would lift all of our eyes heavenward. Lead us now, please, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to be looking at the shaking this morning. As I've been going through the order of events that I preached a few weeks ago during Sabbath school time, um, I've decided to try to look at some of these events to make sure that, you know, I told you that it can be proved from the Bible. And so it's taking a long time, but I'm getting through them one by one. Um, But I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 12. We're going to be looking at the shaking today. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 12. The Bible says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. God's people are described here in Isaiah 58. It is God's remnant people that has been talked about that would exist at the end of time. They would be repairers of the breach. They would be restorers of paths to dwell in. They would be the ones that would raise up the foundations of many generations. And friends, somebody has been tearing it down, tearing down the foundations of many generations. Somebody has made a breach in the church, a breach in the wall of Zion, and the remnant is that which shall repair it. Friends, this is talking about within our church. When I say that someone has been tearing down the foundation, I don't want you to cast your minds to the Antichrist, someone from within the church, Because when you look at the beginning of Isaiah 58, it says, Cry aloud, spare not, show my people their transgressions. And friends, so turn with me in your Bibles now to Malachi chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6. Malachi chapter 4, speaking about that remnant movement that would exist at the end of time. Malachi chapter 4, and we're starting there in verse 5. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day 
of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Sounds like the restoring of the foundations of many generations. The hearts of the fathers will be turned to the hearts of the children. There will be reconciliation and unity. But it says here that Elijah the prophet would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You see, friends, in the Bible, there are three Elijahs. There's first the literal Elijah found in 1 Kings chapter 17. Then there's John the Baptist. And we'll look at a text in a minute there. And there is a third Elijah coming as well. How do I know? Because Elijah, the literal one, never came before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And John the Baptist, he pronounced the great and glorious day of the Lord, not the great and dreadful Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. We are studying about the shaking this morning. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible says about John the Baptist, when you study and read the earlier verses, it's talking about John the Baptist. And it says, And he, John the Baptist, shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom to the just. So friends, this is John the Baptist, but he would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah of old. He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Yes, he would preach the message of repentance and even baptism. He would come a time in a time when there was well nigh universal apostasy, even as it was in the days of a literal Elijah. The literal Elijah was the one that stood before King Ahab and Jezebel and said and pronounced a fateful judgment of no rain until he himself said so. Why? Because God's people were in apostasy. And John the Baptist would also appear at a time that would be similar to Elijah. God's people are lukewarm. They are in a state of hot and cold. Sin is running rampant. And he would have to stand before a king as well. Or rather, King Herod. He would pronounce what? Judgment upon him because he was taken in fornication with his brother's wife. And friends, here I want you to notice in verse 17 of Luke chapter 1, it says that this Elijah, the third Elijah would come to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Friends, the third Elijah, this movement, it wasn't any singular person that would arise in the future, but it would be a movement that would also make people to be prepared for the Lord. The remnant would come in the spirit of and in the power of Elijah. And friends, the third Elijah movement is not any singular person. It is a movement. It is a remnant. It is referring to a group of people that would wrap up the work of God just before Jesus comes for a second time. He would, they would rather come in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. You know, Revelation chapter 12 is divided into three sections. Some people say four, but it doesn't matter. There are three sections, main sections that tie it all in. The first is in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's turn our Bibles there. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. It talks about this woman. Revelation 12 verse 1, the Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She starts off this first section. It's the woman and the dragon. And then it transitions into something else. He persecutes that woman for 1,260 days, 538 to 1798. The 1,260 year prophecy is the second section of Revelation 12. And then the third section is the remnant at the very end of time. She is exactly the same as the woman. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to give you all the details right now concerning that woman, but this woman is exactly the same as the remnant. The remnant of her seed is exactly the same 
as this woman. But you know what's very interesting in the book of Revelation? For those that have been studying with me, we just studied this. Is Revelation chapter 2 and 3. It talks about God's church throughout all time. And just before the last church, there is this special church. It's the church of, Laod- uh, church of Philadelphia. The church of Laodicea is the last church. But the Philadelphia church is just the church before it. And you know when you look at the contrast, because it's a timeline of God's church throughout time. It's a contrast. The Philadelphia church is talking about that Millerite movement, the early Advent movement where there was great revivals taking place and God's Spirit was truly being poured out. People were repenting. People were looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The church of Philadelphia has no rebuke. It has no rebuke. And that was that Millerite movement where God's work was moving forward from strength to strength. The love of God was burning bright. That was what the the word of Philadelphia means brotherly love. They were spurring each other on. People were getting forward, are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then what happens? It's almost as overnight the church flips a switch and we enter into the church of Laodicea, lukewarm. The word Laodicea does not mean lukewarm. It means a people judged or people under judgment. For truly, we have been under judgment since 1844. But you know what? There was nothing bad to say about the Church of Philadelphia. But when we come to the Church of Laodicea, there's nothing good to say about it. It's a church in apostasy. It's a church in apostasy. And friends, that is nothing we face that is new today. Today, it's nothing new. We shouldn't be surprised about what we see, even in our churches of today. Yes, God has his faithful people. He does. But in a general sense, the church of Laodicea is the main characteristics that we see in our churches of today. Friends, it is a church in apostasy. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 5. You know, apostasy was nothing new, even in Nehemiah's day. It is, has been nothing new, really, throughout the whole scriptures. But in Nehemiah chapter 12, you know, after Nehemiah 5, he, he goes home for a short while. And, and when you get to Nehemiah chapter 12 and 13, guess what? God's people have fallen into apostasy. What has happened? Um, there is a misappropriation of funds, of tithe. Um, Nehemiah, he went back to Medo-Persia and to serve the king. And guess what? They let this guy by the name of Tobiah come back in. He was the one that was opposing Nehemiah when they are building the walls, Sanballat and Tobiah. And all of a sudden, guess what? Tobiah, he's living in a room right next to the temple precincts. It's where the tithes and the offerings are stored. And as a result, The tithes and the offerings are not getting to the Levites, and the Levites have gone back to work in the fields, to to work for a livelihood because the sanctuary itself and the services are not able to pay them. They've gone into apostasy. And when, when Nehemiah comes back, he has to kick Tobiah out. Not only that, in Nehemiah 12, 13, you see Sabbath breakers, people, they are treading the wine press on the Sabbath and buying and selling on the Sabbath. And then at the very end, there's a mingling of unbelievers, mixed marriages. In our days, you call it with Adventists with non-Adventists. There is these mixed marriages that are taking place. And so we see, even in those days, apostasy running rampant. But turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 5. During that chapter, there was this unfair treatment of the poor and of the people. People had to sell themselves and sell their land for money, and they weren't getting it back. And Nehemiah hears about it. And in Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 11, let's turn the Bibles there. Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 11. The Bible says, Restore, I pray you, to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn, the wine, the oil that ye exact of them. So Nehemiah is appealing to those that have rich and have the money and said, please restore it all. Give it back. He's pleading for them to turn back to God. 
Verse 12, Then said they, We will restore them, and require nothing of them, so will we do as thou sayest. Praise the Lord. The, the hearts of those rulers, the ones that had the, the means and the capabilities, they were willing to restore everything that had been taken. But then Nehemiah says, Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. And so he calls in the priests and he asks them to witness, to make a promise and an oath before them, which is really before God. But you know what? Nehemiah is not done yet. He's not done yet. Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Also, I shook my lap. Nehemiah shook his lap. And you know, I've read some different concordances. I mean, what is the meaning of this shaking of the lap? What, 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 what is he doing here? Is he literally shaking his lap? It seems to indicate it. Even though in the SDA Bible commentary, it says that he shook the, the hem of his sleeve. I don't know, but it, it sounds pretty clear that he shook his lap there, okay? What is the meaning of this shaking of his lap? Do you know what Nehemiah is doing? He's acting out a parable, a prophecy. He's acting out something. And he, so, so after the, the, the people, they, they shake, uh, they, they promise to give back all that they had taken. Even though they've confirmed it with an oath before the priests, Nehemiah is not done yet. He goes on to act out this prophecy. And he shakes his lap. And he says what? So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen. And praise the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. You know, the, the answer that God prescribed to those that persist in their rebellion, that God would shake them out. Meaning what? Those that were not willing to live up to the promise that they had just made. He's saying that God would shake you out one day. You know, friends, the shaking is biblical. It's not just an Ellen White. She got it from the Bible, but she expounded upon it and gave us even more detail. Praise the Lord for the writings of Ellen White. But friends, there are three levels to the shaking. We looked at this the last time when we looked at the timeline of events that we looked at in Sabbath school. And there's all those slides there. And I, you, I quoted all of it from Ellen White. But I want to show you from the Bible that there are three levels of shaking. Do you know that? The first level of the shaking is what? False theories, heresy. Let's turn the Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Look at what the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. It doesn't say the word shaking there, but guess what? There will be people that will depart from their faith. They will leave. Why? Because of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. False theology. False theology. Let's look at another text, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. And I just want you to notice, in Timothy, it said those that have the false theology, they're the ones that will depart. 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction." Do you see that? There would be false teachers that would come in. There would be false prophets that would come in and that would teach damnable, what? Heresy. And we saw this in Revelation. They're called the Nicolaitans in Revelation chapter 2. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go through the book of Revelation. But they would bring in damnable heresies and people will depart from the faith. One more, Jude chapter 1 and verse 4. Jude chapter 1 and verse 4. Look at what the Bible says. 
And we, we can see multitudes of texts. There are people out there promoting and preaching false doctrines all the time. Jude chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness making God's grace dirty and filthy and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, there would cause a shaking among God's people. There would be false theories, false doctrines, what we call also the winds of doctrine. Friends, this is the first level of the shaking. And dare I say, it's been going on for many, many years already. Friends, you got to be careful who you listen to. Don't trust anybody, even in the Adventist church. Yes, I'm going on public record saying this. Just because they attend church, it doesn't mean that you can trust them. you got to test all things. you got to test what I say. I hope that you're writing down all the Bible texts, that you go back and search for yourselves to see if these things be so. I'm not saying that you don't just trust nobody at all, but friends, you got to test everything. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is true. So we got to be good Bereans. We got to make sure that we are following the truth and not falsehood. So before you jump to conclusions, before you make a comment and think that you're right, make sure you go back and study these these things out to make sure that they're right. Amen? Because there would be a shaking that will be caused by false doctrine. The second level of the shaking. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Do you see that? The church is not clean. He has to cleanse it. He's going to shake it. How is he going to clean it? With the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Friends, God, he's going to marry a pure church. That church is not pure yet. That church is not pure yet. There was a parable that Jesus talked about, how he sowed good seed into his field, and then the enemy came by at night and sowed what? Tares. And when the servants woke up, they said, how come where these tares come from? He said, the enemy has done this. And the servants asked him, should we go and root up these tares? He said, nay, lest at the same time you root up the good seed as well, the wheat. Let both grow together until the end of time. And at the harvest, God would send forth his angels and gather up and separate those two. Friends, even today, as we live in the world, God's church has wheat and also tares. And here it says that Jesus himself would cleanse it with what? The washing of water by what? The word. The word of God would cleanse his church. It would be cleansed with the Bible. This is what we call the straight truth, friends. The first level of the shaking is false doctrine. And maybe these two can coincide together. But the first level that we've seen today is false theories, heresies coming in. And people, when they hear it, they would depart from the church. They would leave. Friends, even those that are not Adventists, that maybe you're listening, there's a lot that is said about the Adventist church that is negative. Don't just listen to people. Go and search for yourselves. I challenge you, search the scriptures to see if these things are true, what we're teaching. But... The word of God would cause also a shaking amongst God's people. Turn to me in your Bible to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20. You know, Jeremiah, he had to speak a straight truth, you know. It was difficult for him. He did not have a pleasant job as a prophet. He was persecuted from one end of Jerusalem to the other end. His life was constantly in danger. And look at what he says in Jeremiah chapter 20. Let's turn our Bibles there. Jeremiah 20 Verse 7, Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. He, he is not happy. God, you deceived me. 
Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Every one mocketh me. There were enemies on every side of Jeremiah. He said, you deceived me. But you're stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Every one mocketh me. For since I spake, verse 8, for since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. You see that? He's saying, God, I've been faithful to, to you as a prophet. I've been give, giving your message a certain sound. I've been preaching the straight word. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me. And derision daily. The word of the Lord was made a reproach. Why? People were persecuting him for what he said. He spoke the straight truth. And he did not want to speak it anymore. He was in derision daily. God, I cried out and look at the result. But then, verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He was ready to give up. And you know, sometimes, friends, you got to understand, the straight truth is not easy to preach. Why? People will rise against you. People will say stuff. People call you perfectionists. They'll give you all sorts of brands and titles. You know that? But just as Jeremiah was ready to hang it up and call it a day as a prophet, you know what he says? Thank the Lord that verse 9 does not end there. <laughs> Where he says, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Thank God he doesn't stop there. He says, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. As much as he wanted to be quiet, as much as he was facing all these terrible things because of the word of God, yet he even in his own mind says, God, I'm done. I'm not going to make mention of you anymore. I'm not going to speak anymore in your name, but your word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. Friends, have you experienced that in your life? It sounds like Jeremiah had caught the straight testimony fever. He could not but speak the things which he had heard and seen with his own eyes. He could not, even though his heart told him to stop. He caught the straight testimony fever. Friends, once you have the straight testimony experience, you will have this. Even though you want to stop, God says you got to continue. And the word of God will be as burning fire. Shut up in your bones. Come with me to Jeremiah 26 and verse 2. Jeremiah 26 and verse 2. Look at this. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of where? The Lord's house. This is not outside in the world. This is in the church, friends. Why? Because God's People are well nigh in universal apostasy. Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them. Diminish not a word. Friends, if the word of the Lord is like fire, burning fire, shut up in your bones, you cannot but speak the word of the Lord. And we must be careful not to diminish a single word. We must make sure not to bring down that word of God that God has clearly put in the word of God. It is called the straight testimony. Why? Because God needs a straight testimony to wake up his people today. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 14. Look at this. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 14. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall what? Devour them. Friends, the words in his mouth would become like fire and would devour them. That's the straight testimony. Do you see that? We just got to make, make we just got to make sure that we aren't like wood today, spiritually dead and dried up. The words in the prophet's Jeremiah's mouth would devour them. It's a straight testimony. Matthew chapter 10 verse 34. Turn with me in your Bibles there. 
Even Jesus said it himself. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, the Bible says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. The sword of the word of God would divide as well. The, the false doctrines, those people that come in and, and preach wrong things, heresies, that will cause a departing from the church. But then that, that second level is that straight testimony and people will not be able to take the word of God. It would consume them. They would get upset. They would get offended. They would leave the church as well. Friends, no matter what happens, may your faith stay strong in Jesus Christ and upon his foundation that we will never be shaken out. We won't get offended by false theologies and we won't get offended by the truth as well. We will be calm and we'll be collected and we will make sure that we walk with Jesus every step of the way. There would be shaking and Jesus, he would send the shaking as well. He would send a sword. It would divide. It would divide. But the third level of the shaking is persecution. The third level of the shaking is persecution. Let's turn our Bibles to Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, and we're looking at verses 5 and 6. Let's turn our Bibles there. Micah chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Do you see that? Don't trust your friend. But usually the friends are the ones that you can trust. But Jesus says, don't trust your friend. Don't put confidence in a guide. Ah, Isn't that what we're meant to do? Put confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Be careful what you say. Be careful, for the person that lieth in your bosom is usually the one that's closest to you. Be careful what you say to those that are your loved ones. Can you believe that? Why? For the son dishonoreth the father. The daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. You know, when we read Matthew 10, 34, Jesus then goes on to quote Micah chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. Jesus is going to come and send a sword. Friends, do you know that those in the church one day will be divided, even in the home? You've got to be careful about your friend. You've got to be careful to not put confidence in a guide and what you say. You know, friends, as a preacher, I say a lot. I've got to be extra careful. Why? A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Do you see that? One day there'll be division, even in the church, even in the home. And the work of Elijah was what? To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. Friends, the work of the true church, the work of the remnant is to unite that, to go against that third shaking. As God is trying to shake everyone out, the remnant is trying to what? Convert people as fast as possible so they'll remain. That's the work that God has called us to today. But there will be a great persecution one day. It's called the mark of the beast, friends. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Friends, throughout the Bible, God describes his shaking and the purification of the church. Today, we are not the church triumphant. We are not the spotless bride yet. Ellen White describes the church as the church militant. We are in the militant phase. Yes, friends, we got to fight. Not divide the church intentionally, but we got to fight against those that are against the truth. We got to fight, friends. We are the church militant. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Amos chapter 9 and verse 9. Amos chapter 9 and verse 9. Look at what the Bible says here, talking about the shaking. Amos chapter 9 and verse 9, For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain 
fall upon the earth. So even though there is this sifting and the church will be sifted by fiery trials, guess what? Not even, here's that beautiful promise, not even the least grain will fall upon the earth. Friends, God will watch over his own. Even them with the smallest of faith will be taken care of. And Daniel 2 gives us a similar understanding. Do you know that? Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. At the end of that vision, it says, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away. You know, uh, I, I've never seen wheat in this sense before. But, you know, when I was younger, my, my mom always used to bake peanuts. And she'd tell me to go out to the backyard and crush all the, the skin that has been baked. Crush, 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 crush. And then all you have to do is just flip it up and blow. And all the little, the, 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 the light skin will just float away. Friends, that is a shaking. Do you understand that? This is how God is going to separate the chaff from the wheat. This is how he's going to separate those that look like they're religious and godly from those that really are godly. Today, that is not our work. We've got to be faithful to the word of God. Make sure that we don't get sifted out by false doctrine and make sure we hold on when persecution comes. Psalms chapter 1 and verse 4 says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Friends, there will be a shaking. and We've got to be careful. And in Amos chapter 9, even though there would be this sifting, you know what happens? The next verse, Amos chapter 9 and verse 10. All the sinners of my people, all the what? Sinners of what? My people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake us, nor prevent us. You know, there's this group of people that, that they're sinners and, and they say nothing bad is going to happen to us. We're going to be okay. God's going to save us when he comes. Oh no, friends, they're going to die by the sword. You know what that sword is? It's the word of God. It's doing the cutting. It's the sword of the Spirit found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, which is the word of God. It's that sword that is in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that is sharper than any two-edged sword, divining asunder even to the joints and marrow and the soul. It's a discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart. Friends, the sinners will no, not be able to stand in that day. God, he's not going to stop from coming from heaven. But first, they're going to be separated. The sword is going to cut them. And they're going to die by it. But then look at Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. In that day... Will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen? Wait a minute. David never had a tabernacle. King David never built a temple, a dwelling place for God. What is the tabernacle of David? It is Solomon's temple. You know why? King David, he was the one that thought of this idea. It was his idea to make the temple of God, but Solomon, his son, would be the one that would complete it. King David brought in all the materials ready to build it. Solomon just had the easy job of making it, even though it's called Solomon's temple. But the seed and the idea came from King David. And so friends, what about the tabernacle of David that has fallen? And close up the what? The breaches thereof. I will raise up his ruins. I will build it as in the days of old. Friends, God is saying that he's going to close up those breaches. He's going to fix those ruins. And the temple of God is going to be magnificent. Jesus then will come and claim them as his own. It will be built as in the days of old. Friends, that church in the apostolic times, it's going to come back in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Praise the Lord. God is going to pour out his spirit again and we're going to have a remnant that will come in God's spirit and in his power and his tabernacle is going to be rebuilt again. Oh friends, there's coming a shaking. There's coming a shaking to God's church. There is from false theories, from straight truth and even from fiery trials. Look how Solomon describes God's church 
Turn with me in your Bibles to Song of Solomon, chapter 6. You know, that's a book that we hardly ever, if ever, turn to. But man, some of those images that you see that Solomon talks about is too graphic sometimes. And so we don't often talk, talk about this book. But let's turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 6 and verse 10. Look at what the Bible says. Song of Solomon, chapter 6 and verse 10. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? Who is she? Can you believe that? Solomon's like, you, you know, Solomon, he was the wisest man that ever lived. He had hundreds of wives, and I'm telling you, these women were beautiful. Beautiful. It's not that he chose just anybody. But he was the wisest, he was the richest. People were coming and offering his, his daughters to them, him all the time. And he had the pick of the cream of the crop. And yet he turns around and says, who is this? Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? Fair as the moon, clear as the sun. You know what that sounds like? Revelation chapter 12 verse 1. A woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, crowned with 12 stars. You know what that's describing in Revelation 12 verse 1, friends? It's the apostolic church. It's the early church. And Solomon is like asking, who is this? And she's what? Terrible as an army with banners. You see, friends, God's church is not just some dainty little woman who, who's nice and simple and clothed in the righteousness of God. Friends, she is also terrible as an army with banners. She's going forth, conquering and to conquer. In Revelation, we see her picture as a white horse and no one can stand in his way. The church of Ephesus was a pure white church. It could detect those false apostles and false teachers a mile away. Friends, today we are not the church triumphant. We are the church militant. There is a work for us to do. And God, He is allowing these trials to come upon His church today. And there are many, there are many, my friends, that are going to leave because of the shaking. But we got to do the work of the remnant today. We got to save that which can be saved. We got to pray today, friends. We got to study with those that we that need to be studied with so that they can be converted to the truth. Friends, this is the work of the remnant in the last days. Isaiah 28. Look at this. Isaiah 28. Look at how Isaiah describes the church at the end of time. Isaiah 28, starting in verse 5. Look at this. And in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto what? The residue, the remnant of his people. God, he is going to be a crown of glory to God's people on earth. They will perfectly reproduce his character at the end of time. Do you see that? He will. This residue is referring to the remnant. But look at what it says in verse 6. <clears throat> Isaiah 28 and verse 6. For a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Yes, friends, at the end of time, God's remnants will be given judgment. But look at else at what it says in verse 6. And for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. What does it mean that we will turn the battle to the gate? What is that referring to? You see, friends, God's enemies, they've made inroads. They've made inroads into God's church, into God's last day remnant Elijah movement church. And it says that we're going to turn that battle around and we're going to turn it all the way to the gate. What gate is this? Are we going to kick them out of our gate? No. We are going to take the battle all the way back to the gate of the enemy. Do you know that? Back to their city. We are going to turn around and we are going to become victorious. What gate is this referring to? Let's go to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Where will we take this battle all the way to? What gate is this? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. The Bible says, And I say unto thee, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, not Peter, 
Upon Jesus Christ, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What gate is this talking about? It's the gate of hell, friends. We are going to take the battle all the way back to Satan's kingdom and overthrow it. This is the work of the remnant. The church is going to be victorious at the end of time. We are in a church militant right now. We got to fight, friends. There is a shaking that is taking place among God's people. We're going to take it back all the way to the gates of hell. And that city is not going to prevail. You know what city that is? Revelation 14 verse 8. The second angel's message. What is it? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city. Oh, friends, God's people, we're going to march all the way to the promised land. And we're going to go forth conquering and to conquer. We're going to be the head and not the tail. Friends, you know, today, we are not there yet. We are not there yet. The church is not purified yet. We are on the way. The first level of the shaking has already taken place. So has the second. And friends, soon enough, the third level of the shaking is going to come upon us. And when God has finally shaken his church, then the church is going to be triumphant. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27. This is what the Bible says about the shaking. Hebrews 12 verse 27 And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, and that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Friends, everything at the end of time is going to be shaken. And those things that are shaken out, they're going to be removed. And those things that will not be shaken, they will remain. Friends, what, what can we do to overcome this? We've got to make sure our foundation is sure, that it's solid, that we will remain at the end of time no matter what happens, that when that shaking is done, God will finally have a pure church. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, you know what it says? Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Friends, we must be settled into the truth. we got to be settled because the shaking is coming. And unless we are settled, all that we have will be shaken out. I want to share a quote with you in closing. Taken from Last Day Events 219, paragraph 4. LDE 219.4. This is what Ellen White talks about. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, It has already begun. Friends, there is coming a day when everything that can be shaken will be shaken and the only thing that remains is God's people who receive the seal of God versus the mark of the beast. Friends, what is that seal of God? It is settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually today. You know, friends, growing up, I'm I'm the youngest in the family. I'm the youngest. Even though uh, many people say I look older than my brother. Uh, And he's four years older than me, by the way. But I'm the youngest in the family. And, you know, the youngest one is usually the follower. And because of that, I grew up very fickle-minded, you know. It's much easier to follow people than make decisions on your own. But through circumstances that were prearranged by God, God made me grow up very quickly. And uh, going overseas to study really helped me and um, made me more independent, made me live up to my own decisions that I made on my own personally. 
And there have been decisions that I've made that, you know, I regret. And some of these decisions have followed me around for the rest of my life. They still are today. But I praise the Lord that God, He still allows me to be a minister, to be able to preach and to share the Word of God. And it's a high calling, friends. It's a high calling. But every day that passes by as I, I, I look at these things about the truth that I'm sharing, there's also a life that I must live. And now as a husband and a father, I'm making decisions not just for myself anymore, but for my whole family. And as much as I'm praying, I'm praying that God will give me wisdom to know how to lead my family in the right way. That I would now no longer be just a follower, but I would be a leader. And friends, if we want to make sure that we are not shaken out at the end of time, we've got to make sure that we're not just following man, but that we're following the truth as it is in Jesus. That every day the decisions that we're making, that we won't appear fickle-minded. It's like, okay, uh, this person I met, now I'm going to do this. And then, oh, not, not my friends, and now I'm going to do that. But we're not running to and fro and everywhere and confused about our faith. But that every day as it passes by, that, you know, we're making decisions for eternity. We're either settling more into the faith of Jesus Christ, or we're settling more into the mind of the world. And we have to make these decisions. To sit on the sideline is a decision. But everybody at the end of the day will be involved, friends. God can only seal us by the decisions that we make. He can only seal us as we make decisions for His truth and stand up for that which is right. You know, friends, when it comes to the truth, if you hear His voice today, you got to act on it today. Fiery trials will come, and every trial that you overcome, as you gain victory over it, it settles you more into the truth. Do you understand that? So really, today is a day of salvation. Today, as you sit here and you're listening to the voice of, and the message that you, you, from this sermon, you, you're making decisions. And the experiences that you're going to face when you turn off this live stream is going to make you settle even more into decisions. And I pray that we would allow him to place his seal upon us. I pray that through the lives and the decisions that we are making today, we are settling more into the truth, settling into the Sabbath truth that we will purpose in our hearts that would never defile God's holy Sabbath, settling more into the Ten Commandments, settling more into the truths that we know in God's Word that we even studied about this morning, truth versus tradition, that we're settling more into these truths that God has for us. Friends, the seal of God shows that we belong to Him and not to the devil. The seal of God shows that we are His fully inside and the out. And we need to be sealed today unto the day of redemption. Friends, let's pray. Let's pray that God would help us to make wise choices with how we use our time so that when the sealing is finally done, no matter what comes, even when God shakes the whole world, we will remain. That is my earnest plea and prayer for every one of you, for myself as well, that we would lead our families into the right paths, that we'll be a good example to our friends and all those that are around us, from our colleagues to our classmates to the lecturers to our families maybe who have not chosen for Christ. Let us make sure that we are choosing for time and eternity today. Every action matters. Let's make it count, moment by moment, hour by hour. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh Lord, there is coming serious times upon this earth. The devil, he's going to divide. He's going to try and destroy our lives. He's as a roaring lion, Lord. Please help us. Guide us with your truth. 
Help us to settle into it. That we would purpose in our hearts to be faithful to you in this coming week. Seal your spirit in our hearts, Lord. Seal your word in our hearts that these decisions that we're making might not be fleeting sand and just gone with the wind, but that truly as we seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, that you'd settle us even more. That as we read and reread the truth, that Father, we make decisions and recommit our lives to you again this week. And Lord, help us not to get caught up with all the world's business and busyness, but help us, Father, to recommit our lives to you today. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Give us a double portion, please. We cannot do it without you. And help us to be settled in your truth today. Seal us, O Lord, in our foreheads that truly you might prepare us for the times that are coming ahead. We surrender again to you, O Lord. Please be with us, we pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Although it's a more serious message, I pray that you would have a blessed Sabbath today and that we would be settled more into the truth this afternoon, that we'd contemplate more of his wondrous works from the Word of God, that we'd take more time for prayer. And then, please join us again this evening at 7 o'clock as we close our Sabbath time together. May God bless each and every one of you. May God place his seal on each of us this day. Happy Sabbath, friends. And I look forward to seeing you back at 7 o'clock this evening as we close Sabbath together. Until then, take care and God bless. See you.